Hello and welcome to Not a Buffalo, the show where we discuss the science and technology that will save the world. My name's Ben, Lord of the Geranium Throne, and joining me is Jack. He once sat on a throne and was then sternly asked to leave. Jack, what's the crack? The crack? What crack? I've adopted the Irish way of saying how are you or what's the news or what's the gossip. We say what's the crack. Oh, oh that's fun. But we say, um, we, we spell crack C-R-A-I-C because it's Irish. Because I thought crack was... Yeah, no, that's not PG. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm cracking. Everything's cracking on fine here. It's, it's all good. See, if you were Irish, if you were answering in Irish, you'd say, "Yeah, grand. How are you?" Or any crack with you? You don't have to do the accent. So the, oh, good. I'm grand. Perfect. <laughs> I'm grand. I'm grand. Have you got some interesting stories for us this week? Uh, I have. T- so I have like a science one, which is like a really nice, slightly niche science one. Um, and I have one which is definitely not about science, but it's so lovely. Why don't you start off uh, with with the, the science one then? With the science? Okay. Okay, so science-y one. They found, a new, uh, they found a new ion deep in space, which they thought probably would have um, chemistryed away by, uh, by this time. So it's the helium hydride ion, um, which is an early ion which is in the history of the universe because... It's made up of entirely helium and hydrogen, which are very light elements. But it's also extremely reactive. So if it's, say, on Earth, it's probably just going to react with something. and uh, Like, it's really super reactive. Like It's like Nigel Farage, but chemistry. It's like Nigel Farage, but chemistry. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And it lives in a planetary nebula, which I'm, I'm sure no one, would, no one would want to send Nigel Farage to a planetary nebula. Because they're a good long for way him. away. I Oh, I don't know. I think people would miss him. Uh, I think the BBC would probably miss him. I mean, what else would they actually put on the news? The Green Party? Heaven forbid. <laughs> yeah, that, that party that won seats in Parliament. Why would you put them on? <laughs> exactly. This is very political for a science podcast today, isn't it? Yes, I'm sorry. Back, back to the ion. Ion. Yeah, so it's positively charged. And they found it for the first time, like, this month in a planetary nebula they thought it would have sort of have all gone but yeah so that's that's the fun thing that happened oh also they did this from a plane which is kind of cool so they they oh. have like so you know like they have space telescopes because there's less stuff in the way of space and your telescope if your telescope is in space yes yeah so they have space telescopes and they have ground telescopes and space telescopes are really good at looking at stuff but not so good at getting updated because once something's in space it's an awful it's an awful hassle to send up an engineer yeah whereas the ground telescopes are all like really easy to well relatively easy to upgrade because they're on the planet that the en- most engineers are on so they sort of did a halfway house and they've developed this thing called sophia which is uh, a collaboration between nasa and a german aerospace engineering company and it's basically a telescope in a plane with all modular components that can be switched in and out really easily and upgraded so it runs on like the latest tech but it's also got less stuff between it and the stuff in space than a telescope that's closer to the ground because the stuff in between you know like atmosphere i'm just imagining an observatory with wings is that what it looks like like literally a dome with a massive telescope sticking out of it and then just little wings on the side not really it looks like a regular plane really it's called uh sophia i think and it just looks it looks really cool <laughs> i saw a couple of diagrams of it i've not seen an actual picture of it i've only seen blueprints and diagrams because i'm you know that's the kind of that's the kind of place i get my news <laughs> but yeah it's uh, it's kind of awesome I think it was a German astrophysicist as well who discovered this. So that's a, another good win for German science. So what's the implication of, of discovering this ion that should have disappeared 14 billion years ago? I guess that planetary nebulas are a lot more boring than we thought because like, that means there's not that much chemistry going on there. It might be, I'm not sure about this, but it might be one of those times where they, uh, they're they just looking back a long way in the history of the universe by looking very far away from us because of you know, that pesky limit of light, speed of travel. It does just look like a regular plane. If you Google Sophia plane, you can see it. Um, it's got like an open bit at the side, which I guess is what the telescope is looking out of. Okay. I'm going to add that to our show notes to remind us to add a picture of Sophia the plane Yeah, to the show notes. She is my favourite plane now. <laughs> she sounds like a great plane, Jack. Oh, I love planes. Very good. So yeah, that, that's my first 
that was my first and only science-related story. My other story is very non-science, but so happy. It's such a happy story. Well, this is great because I have a story that is also not science related, but links Ooh, like very it. well back to our previous episode. I don't remember our previous episode. Do you remember it had something to do with Liechtenstein? Not really. How do you not remember it? It was only two weeks ago. I've slept since then, like twice. Do you, do you subscribe to attic theory? That your brain can only hold so much and you push out what you don't need? Maybe, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, in our previous episode, mm. we spent a lot of time talking about Liechtenstein. And this story concerns uh, two members of the European nobility in the late 19th century. Princess Pauline von Metternich of Austria oh. and Russian Countess Anastasia Kilmanzeg. I love everything about European history now. <laughs> yeah, I love her name. Countess Kilmanzeg. I'm not sure if that pronounced it correctly. I'm probably not. It doesn't matter. It's still great. <laughs> but basically, the story goes... That they uh, they had a disagreement. Um, they were they were both heavily involved in the upcoming Vienna musical and theatrical exhibition, and <laughs> they had a disagreement over flower arrangements. And so they did the only thing that seemed sensible to the two of them because they got quite into a heated argument. And that was they decided to have a duel. Okay. They decided they couldn't have the duel in Vienna for some reason. So they both went to Vaduz, which is the capital of Liechtenstein, as we learned in the last episode, and uh, mm. decided to duel there. We did learn that. But then there was a surgeon who said that they shouldn't duel with their clothes on because if they get stabbed through their clothes, then the, the rapier will push the clothes, the dirty clothes into the wound and the wound will likely become infected. And so they dueled topless over flower arrangements in the capital of Liechtenstein. They are both women. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they're, bo <laughs> they're both women. Apparently not as unusual as, uh, uh, as you might expect. But yeah, sorry, it was uh, Princess Pauline von Metternich of Austria and Russian Countess Anastasia Kilmanzeg. So yeah, both, both women. Wow. The Princess of Austria lived to the ripe old age of 85. Both of them, I should say, survived the duel with, with minor scratches. I believe it was the Austrian who won by drawing first blood. But wow. uh, they, uh, the Austrian lady lived until... She was 85, but the, the Countess from Russia was unfortunately executed in the Bolshevik uprising uh, just a few years later. Jeez. Bolsheviks happen, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, when when people tell you to, like, treat a girl like a princess, you execute them in a socialist uprising, do you think you're breaking contract there? Only if you assume that by treat like a princess, you only have positive connotations from that. But y you presumably are still treating them by a princess by declaring them a member of the the bourgeoisie aristocracy that need to be executed just mm. not the way i think the original idea was intended of being treated like a princess but also princesses weren't treated that well throughout history i mean a lot of the time yeah. they were sold for political <laughs> marriages which isn't yeah. really isn't what i think most people mean when you say get treated like a princess mm, it does see, it does seem somehow wrong doesn't it like not in keeping with the spirit yeah this is why this is why AIs will never be any good at treating women like princesses. That was also a reference to our our previous podcast <laughs> because of the the law thing in that country called Estonia. See, you do remember some of it. I think it's once you once you sort of like poke at one bit of it, it all sort of gets pulled back in. You know, it's like collecting a fishing net. You know, you it's you don't know it's there, and then you scoop it out, and you like, and then you're suddenly tangled in a load a web of the past. I have a story on fishing nets, actually. If we want to to move on, what a segue! <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was just yeah, waiting. Let's do this. I know Jack's going to talk about fishing nets at some point, so I'll just save this story <laughs> yeah. very quickly. Actually, so ocean plastic is obviously a huge issue at the moment, and it's it's killing the planet essentially. And one of the big problems is fishing nets that get lost in storms or get swung overboard or they simply can't lift them up because of the amount of fish in them and so they trail around the ocean and uh, and fish get trapped in them and it's a process called ghost fishing apparently where the, these nets that are basically floating around still catch fish but they found a way of attaching little micro transponders to them so they can track them down and recover them and uh, and save the fish ah. from getting caught so yeah there you go a ni nice good news story about fighting ocean plastic that segued nicely from from fishing stories yeah i like fighting ocean plastic it's something it's incredible the amount of microplastics they're finding everywhere now just oh it's terrifying isn't yeah. it you like <laughs> there's even something i was reading where because my because plankton is now eating the plastic it's and then they die and uh the the plastic or it floats to the top of the the ocean and the it's causing more carbon to be released into the the plastic to stay in the in the ocean and and it's just all all bad all bad
we we have done so many bad things this planet like this is but microplastics are by far one of the worst <laughs> the eu have banned them haven't they i think i remember reading that they've banned single-use plastics oh i thought they banned microplastics as well well microplastics is simply plastics that have been broken down by being discarded so by banning single-use plastics they will hopefully reduce the amount of microplastics that get created oh, no no i'm yeah you're right i'm thinking of the bead things in uh shower yes, gels microbeads they have banned microbeads not microplastics yeah we got there we got there but that was a given that was a slightly depressing story do you have your uh, lovely story that you wanted to talk to us about talk to us talk to me and the audience i guess the, i guess it's us yeah i i think of you as my audience <laughs> So yeah, my my story is just it's one word and you may have already heard of it, but it's it's the one word is chitan. Oh yes, I saw this on uh, last week. Yeah, John Oliver. There you go. Yeah, it's so it's such a happy story, isn't it's it? Lovely. <laughs> it's lovely. It's lovely. Do you want to ex- explain who chitan is to the to the audience? Okay, so uh, there's a lot of otters involved in this. I love there otters. Is, there is a town in southwest Japan. Which is called Sinjoku, I think. No, Susaki. The other otter is called Sin- Shinjoku. Oh, okay. I thought it was Sinjuku was the the town. No, the the otter is called Shinjoku uh, and the town is called Susaki. Town is called Susaki. This is this is why they need publicity. Because <laughs> they... <laughs> they're better known by the otter. Yeah, they did have an official otter, which was a real otter, and they had an otter mascot as well. This official real otter, I don't know how I'm going to explain this without pictures and John Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> but the official lot, the official living real otter got associated with a secondary mascot for the city called Chitan. And this secondary mascot, Chitan, has uh, started <laughs> started displaying what some might describe as uh, aggressive tendencies. You could say that. Yeah, wielding baseball bats and uh, and things like that and the city has gone out of its way to distance itself from the real otter in an official statement in order to distance itself from the mascot of that real otter so that they only now have their real mascot which is called ben shinjuku, shinjuku that thing i think we both said something different there which is different to what we were saying before but never mind yeah i'm sure it'll be fine but yeah so that's that shitan the great thing about shitan is its twitter feed Oh, yes. And its Twitter feed is so beautiful. It does these little videos. Sometimes they're GIFs. Sometimes they're proper videos. They are works of genius in four seconds. If Vines had had Chitan, they would never have gone bust. (laughs) They are... It's so good. I like that the Twitter's in English. Is it translated or do they do it I don't know. But yeah, Chitan, he's, he's wonderful. He occasionally terrorizes tourists. Yes, I've seen that. As, yeah. as part of John Oliver's show covering Chitan, they made a mascot called Chai John and sent it to Japan. And the city where Chitan lives has officially taken ownership of Chai John and it's now the new best friend of the city's actual official mascot. Shinjin. Sin- Shin- yeah, Sinjin. We'll call him Sinjin. <laughs> We'll call well, him Sinjin. I, I probably had this completely wrong, but as I understand Japanese naming conventions and honorifics, Kun is just what you'd say uh, to someone you have affection for. So it's kind of like a friendly term that you'd use at the end. And you put the family name at the beginning, which is Shin. So actually, the mascot's name is just Joe. Because Shin, Joe, Kun. <laughs> so you can call so the mascot we, okay, Joe. So we can just call him Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, I, cool. I, I'm okay with this. To all the Japanese people that I've horrifically offended by getting their culture completely wrong, I, I truly am terribly sorry, and uh, please do correct me if uh, if I did get But only, wrong. we only want to hear your corrections if you're also fairly sure that your correction is wrong. So if you still have doubt, then write in. If you don't have doubt and you're absolutely sure that you know the correct way to do this, we're not interested. <laughs> Yes, we want to add to the misinformation and the fake news Ex- and the alternative exactly. facts and the new truths. Yeah. Well, I think I don't really have a good segue here, but I think we should go from town mascots to fringe presidential candidates. Have you heard of a man called Andrew Yang? No, but this is going to be good, isn't it? So he is um, he's running for the Democratic nomination at the moment. He's, he's definitely you know, not that well known, 
But his platform essentially is that automation is the country's greatest threat. So he's he's actually started attracting fairly big crowds now. Got about five hundred people attending uh, some of his um, some of his campaign speeches now, and he's got a lot of people like engineers and uh, and people from the Reddit community um, are, are tend to be following him because he talks a lot about this. Uh, engineers and the Redneck community. And Reddit community, not Redneck community. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Just to give you an example of the kind of audience he has, his staff has primed the crowd to respond telling us to cheer math when he talks numbers. Like literally what? the crowd the crowd <laughs> chants maths whenever he starts talking about numbers. I okay. But this is and this is my favorite fact from his story. So as I said, he's uh, he's very concerned about automation and the threat it's going to pose to American jobs. So he's got this idea to give every American $1000 a month. Which is a really common idea in Europe, particularly in Nordic basic countries. Basic income, isn't it? Yeah, universal basic income, uh, which has been trialed in, I think it's been trialed in New Zealand. It's definitely been trialed in Finland. You know why it didn't work, Jack? Because they didn't have the right name. Ah. Because Andrew Yang has got a much better name for it. He calls it a freedom dividend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love America. This is amazing. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, you can't give people free money in America in a sophisticated you can give them freedom <laughs> you can give them freedom you can't give them a sophisticated social welfare system because that's that's communism and that's terrible but you can give them freedom dividend oh yeah 100 yeah bernie sanders move over yeah i think i mean to be fair i don't know <laughs> anything else and i think as as responsible podcasters podcasters we should say podcasters <laughs> You, you should look into your candidates and your preferred candidate, in fact, all of the candidates, and find out where they stand on a multitude of issues and only vote for the ones that you feel will do a good job all around. And don't just vote for someone because they want to give you $1,000 a month, which they probably won't be able to because uh, even if you call it freedom dividend, I imagine there's a lot of people who are going to go, that's socialism and communism and they don't want it. Nah, just vote for the guy with the freedom dividend. <laughs> this sounds great. I can't see how this could possibly go wrong. I mean, he seems to be of, he's, he's certainly of Asian heritage, judging from the surname and the, the, the pictures of him. So I imagine that's going to be held pretty hard against him. I mean, it took a lot for them to get an African-American into into power. I have another American political story, which is back to the good news. Well, actually, Andrew Yang is good news, and I hope he does very well, because he's clearly more aware of issues and has actually sensible suggestions to tackle them um, just and actually the- media savvy <laughs> and actually media savvy yes but my other story was that uh, this isn't a presidential candidate but obviously we have the senate elections as well and uh, a man called mark kelly is going to be running for the u.s senate in arizona does that name ring a bell to you the Jeff? astronaut yes the astronaut is running for senate yes and i'm so happy well we need to get into a twitter feud with him why i don't know then it's going to be harder when he's when he's senitent Senator, Senate, in the Senate, like a like senator. president, but in the Senate. When he's a senator, senator. yeah, senator. There you go. <laughs> I, I do like the senator though. That's like a great word for describing how someone gets so warped and corrupted by being in politics that they become senator. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it should be a word. Is it a word? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know, but if it's not trademarked, it's our word. We're going to get that into the Oxford Dictionary Word of the Year. How would you spell yeah, it? Yeah, like senescent, I guess. Senitent. No, did you mean sentient, senate, sentient, or sutton? Oh, wait, no. It has something to do with cardiovascular risk in older women. I guess he's probably clear of that, then. Being a bloke. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I don't have time right now to read all of this, but if people want to know what senitent <laughs> is... Okay, so we can't trademark senitent. <laughs> Have you heard of the insurance company AXA? Because apparently they chose that name because almost every single language around the world can say it. Oh, that's kind of interesting. And no one else will look at it. Like Apparently in no language will they look at it and go AXA or AXA or something. They'll, they'll all know, oh yeah, AXA is just the default guess for most people, for almost every... I know XKCD did something similar with this. They um, Randall Monroe, who owns it and set it up, he uh, just randomly generated four letter sequences until he got an unpronounceable string of letters that you'd have to pronounce each letter as you go for, through it i think he just wanted something that would had no phonetic pronunciation in english Why? that is a great question so i should be able to answer it better <laughs> but i can't ah, the table of turn because <laughs> you know who you, you know who loves horses is mongolians and you know where mongolians live near <laughs> the gobi desert 
<laughs> and you know what's in the Gobi Desert now is China's Mars Base Simulator. Of course it is. Uh, when I first, I, I have to admit, when I first started reading this article, I thought that they they created this kind of training facility to make teenage astronauts that they were going to send to Mars, but they had to start training them as teenagers. It's just an education facility that's forty miles from anywhere, forty kilometers, sorry, from any other town or anywhere else. But apparently, it's a, a place where teenagers go and hang out and learn what it's like to be astronauts. And presumably, some of them will go on and apply to be astronauts. It's interesting that they have it for teenagers. I never really, I'd never really put two and two together and thought, oh yeah, you should train teenagers to do this kind of job. But of course, you kind of have to, don't you? Yeah, I mean, it's going to take decades of training and then decades whilst you're actually on, well, five years, I think, on the spaceship at the current speeds. And then obviously, it's probably a one-way trip. So you're going to be stuck there on Mars. I thought it was a two-year journey if you go from the, the shortest distance between Mars and Earth. And it's then like a year there and then a year, uh, two years back. I thought fi- I saw five years as the, the estimated uh, journey time, but I... That's crazy. May, maybe they can do it in two years based on the kind of spaceship. I mean, it's probably been a, a while since I saw the, the five-year thing. So I imagine technology, especially with Elon Musk on the case, has probably gotten a bit better since then. Yeah, I mean, I am also basically getting those figures from the Martian. <laughs> Well, that was a very scientifically accurate book and film, though, wasn't it? It was really good. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. I remember seeing a video of a guy who was trying to debunk the film and say why they weren't doing science right, but couldn't. So he was very impressed. And then he looked at Avengers Endgame later on and was just like, oh, God, all the science, just basically dismissing things as science. I'm not going to go do any spoilers, by the way. You you can't really... You can't really go into a superhero movie and be all like oh yeah let me just bring in some science here you kind of have to dock your science at the door when you're watching a superhero movie i have to say i think they did it well in that they didn't try and explain the science too much they just kind of went yes science and kind of if we just use the right words because they have done other films in the marvel universe where they have just tried to explain the science too much and it's just gone that that's not how any of that works you're just putting the word quantum in front of everything and it doesn't make any sense. So do you have any more stories for us, Jack? No, I, I only brought along two stories today. One of them science, one of them Cheetan. I, I have a couple more I wanted to mention. Um, for all of those out there who want to see what a, the day in the life of a spy is, the CIA have now CIA, yeah, have now set up their Instagram account. And they've taken a picture of the director's desk. So you can see their wig and their notebook with secrets in it, and their top secret pulp bag, and their badge that they haven't had an updated photo in 35 years. But yeah, if you want to follow the CIA on Instagram, now you can. That's that's a really odd story. <laughs> why, why, why are they joining Instagram now? Apparently it's a, a recruitment tool, like they want to make the public more aware of what the CIA does, except they're obviously not going to actually show any of what they really do. Anyway, we, we should probably just wrap it up there. Thank you very much for listening. Please subscribe to the show to never miss an episode and rate and review us wherever you have the power to do so. If you'd like to get in touch, we are at Not A Buffalo Pod on Twitter, Not A Buffalo Podcast on Facebook, or contact us through our website, notabuffalo.wordpress.com.